Amen. Thank you, Brother Steve. I enjoyed that song service. Man. Some of the great old hymns and faith, right? Amen. Uh, don't get to hear those very often, nor do we get to sing them very often. And so I'm um, just rejoicing, just having a good time in the Lord this morning. Why don't you take your Bibles, if you don't mind. Uh, we are in the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 2. We're actually starting our study on the church at Thyatira. So we'll be looking at verse number 18 through verse number 28. And as we begin to study this passage of Scripture, I uh, often taught, like to remind us that uh, because we believe and we know that the Word of God is alive, it is powerful, it is supernatural, and it's active uh, in our lives, and it's also applicable to our lives, that even though we're studying about a church that, you know, it was in existence several uh, thousand years ago, we recognize that the Holy Spirit of God had the authors pin these words down so that we could develop, grow, learn uh, about who we are, what we're facing in the world today, and how we should live for God's glory in spite of what's going on around us in our community and in our world. Now, even as I say that, I want you, I think we are at such a crucial place in our culture, not only in America, but across the globe, um, I think that we are experiencing in our communities and in our societies, a lot of what was shown to the pastors, particularly in the church of Thyatira. And you probably, if you're on, you know, on the internet very much, if you watch many of the YouTube videos, about preachers today. One of the dominant things that you hear a great deal about is the rise of the feminine spirit, which is associated with many of the old time mystery religions, which goes all the way back into Babylon. And what is interesting is our culture has embraced the spirit of feminism, which is part of, again, false religion, uh, worshiping of female uh, deities of old, if you will, um, it has permeated our culture. And, and as a nation, it definitely has permeated our nation. And I dare say, as I stand in front of church people today, and many more uh, will watch on the internet over the years to come, um, that the church, instead of influencing our culture away from that spirit of feminism, has instead allowed that spirit to invade the church and has in many ways seduced the church into uh, compromised worship, seduced into sacrificing things that are uh, offered to idols, if you will, rather than to the true and living God. And so we have opened our doors as churches um, to things that we should never have opened our doors and we have allowed uh, instead of being salt and light to the world, we have allowed the world to corrupt the body of Christ. Um, doesn't mean that everybody in the church is corrupt. There can be uh, people in the church that are faithful to God um, while the church at large or while the majority of the church uh, might be involved in spiritual adultery. In other words, they are not being faithful to God, even if it's just uh, that they're being faithful to themselves and their own desires, um, self-will, defiant, arrogant, unrepentant. All of those characteristics are the characteristics of the spirit of Jezebel, which we saw, we know Jezebel as an Old Testament character. But what happens is that in the book of Revelation, she is brought to the forefront as the Lord speaks to his church in Thyatira, and he mentions someone by name and calls her Jezebel. And so uh, we recognize that that particular church was experiencing uh, this, this rise of the spirit of Jezebel. There was somebody in their midst, a female, who had risen to the place of prominence and called herself a prophetess. She was self-appointed. You say, well, that doesn't apply to us today. We have women preachers all over the television who have who have basically appointed themselves as pastors. You say, well, how do you know that? Because the Bible says that pastors are basically males. And so any female pastor 
has appointed themselves to that position, whether they've been deceived by lying, seducing spirits, or by a liberal congregation, I don't know, but it is definitely a sign that the church is under the spell, if you will, of Jezebel. And so I think it's appropriate uh, that we are looking at this particular uh, text of scripture here this morning. So we understand there's a message for us here. Uh, I wanna remind you that earlier in chapter number two, in verse number one through seven, we were dealing with the church of Ephesus. You remember that? Now the church of Ephesus was really kind of a model church as it relates to keeping out false doctrine. And they were very hardworking, Bible-believing folks, if you will. And they were, they were adamant, man. They would not allow false teachers into their midst, man, they'd put them out of the church. I mean, they would test their doctrine and, and, and basically would not allow them to prevail. But if you remember, Ephesus, with all the good doctrine, with all the hard work, she had left her first what? Love. Love. And so while she was, you know, sound in her orthodoxy, she had left Jesus. And so she had a problem. Well, I think when we look at the church of Thyatira, we sort of see the opposite, or at least I see the opposite going on. I see a church who has terrible doctrine and who is, yeah, they're, they're busy. It's, he basically says to the faithful in the church, you know, I know your works and all that. We'll talk about that when we get there. So they are busy in some ways, but their doctrine is terrible. But they would say, we're very loving. Now, how did they define their love? I think they define love like the world would define love. And I think the church is so close to becoming like the world in this area that we no longer have the courage to speak the truth in love. Because we've decided that love isn't what God says it is, but it's what the world thinks it is. And love is all about emotion. And it's how do you feel? And how do I feel? And in order for everybody to feel good, we need to be, you know, extremely tolerant of everything, right? And so what we've done in the name of loving people, we say, well, we don't want to judge, right? We, we, that's what we say all the time. So we have replaced what the world's concept of love is for what God says love is. I think true love speaks the truth, don't you? Amen. If you love your grandchildren and they're out there in the yard playing and they run out on the street, what's going to happen? Man, you're going to snatch knot on their head, right? I mean, you're going to go out there and grab them. You're going to bring them back because you love them. You're not going to say, oh, look at little Susie. I love her so much. She's enjoying that busy road so much. I'm just going to let her play out there because, after all, you know, we wouldn't want to hurt her feelings, right? Yeah. And so, no, that's not what true love does. True love protects that little child, brings them off of the street, and gets them where they're safe and sound, right? And that's the way the church ought to be. We ought to speak the truth in love. And so many people today have gone so astray from biblical truth about what is sin, what is not sin, that now we've just kind of developed this sort of mushy, gushy, uh, entertainment field, uh, tolerant um, atmosphere in the life of the church. And I'm afraid a great deal of what is called church is not honoring to God at all. I'm afraid of that. And I'm afraid we're living in that day. I think the church today has become very much like the church in Thyatira in that she has allowed the world to creep in and she looks more like the world than the church. I mean, you just, I don't even have to say any more, do I? <laughs> so, so this church has sort of was misguided and misplaced their love, if you will, and had abandoned all sound do biblical doctrine. And many churches today have done the exact same thing. So before we look at the church, let me just kind of give you a little bit of background, not a lot of background, on the city of Thyatira, because I think that's important. It tells you kind of who, where they are and who they're ministering to. They were basically a military city. The city was built in order to protect Pergamos, which we talked about last week, the church in Pergamos. So the church of Thyatira was in a city that was built to protect Pergamos. So I'm kind of, you know, there's got to be some sort of connection where, where this church in this area ought to be ones to help keep the false doctrine out, and yet they allowed it in. So secondly, it was really a blue-collar kind of town. 
There were a lot of trade guilds. There were a lot of unions. The problem was back then, they would attribute their success to the pagan deities, to false gods, false goddesses. And they would, they would do all sorts of wicked um, religious practices, pagan practices, in order to get the favor of the gods on their side, and therefore they would be successful monetarily as a city and you know, would avoid any judgment from the gods and all that kind of stuff. And so they're all interconnected very much. And so, so what we see is they had taken the bulk of the population and have turned them to false gods in their practices and in their preaching and all that. And God had set a church in the midst of all that so that they could shine the light, season them with salt, if you will, and they might see the way out of the darkness of all of these false religions, pagan gods, and come to light in the true and living God. So, so these are the people they're dealing with, kind of blue-collar folks. And it was sort of, a, I wrote down it was a famous city in its day, but I call it infamous city uh, because with all of the stuff that she had, matter of fact, um, Thyatira was renowned for the purple cloth that it produced. Remember Lydia was from Thyatira. Remember Lydia and her cloth uh, that she would sell. So, so I think about this city and I think about, and I, in my mind, I just tried to get in my mind, what is a picture of a military sort of blue collar type city in America? And, I, and we have kind of a, a, in our nation, we have cities that typically lean more towards like on the coast, you have military cities, you know, um, you're thinking of, you know, where the Navy comes in and out and stuff like that on both coasts. And then e even in the inner parts of the state, our nation, we think of the industrial heartland of America. We think of cities like Buffalo and Pittsburgh and, you know, the big city, New York even, and, and all of that. To me, I think of Thyatira kind of like that. Because, you know, I'm a football fan, and I, and I used to watch a lot of pro football. But once they went so politically correct, I hardly ever watch it anymore. But I can remember watching cities like Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Buffalo, and you know, you, you know. And their fans were rabid. I mean, Philadelphia Eagles are some of the worst fans in all of the NFL, right? They're mean, they're arrogant, they're proud. Of, so I think that's the way Thyatira was. Blue collar, tough and proud of it. Don't say nothing to us, right? Um, so, so I kind of get that picture. I think we have a lot of that in America where we're arrogant as a nation, uh, we're immoral as a nation, no question about that. We are defiant as a nation and we're absolutely proud of it. We're the greatest nation in all the world. That's what we would say with all of that other stuff in our life. And so when I think about Jezebel and I start looking in the Old Testament, we think about that person uh, who specifically influenced the king uh, and basically uh, ran roughshod over God's people during her day, I would just say, and I wrote down several things that I think are characteristics of the spirit of Jezebel. And tell me if you don't see this in our culture, but watch out. Tell me if you don't see this in our churches. And I know you're, I'm not talking about our fellowship only, although we may have some of this. I don't, I don't want to be blind to that either, but I'm just talking about the, the modern professing church, people who name the name of Jesus, but just live like hell. I mean, live like the devil, and, and they're terrible. They're self-willed. They're religiously immoral. In other words, they go to church maybe a little bit, but they wink at their sin, right, Monday through a Saturday. Um, they're stubbornly unrepentant. Hey, I am what I am. I mean, I don't care what you say week in and week out. I don't care what you preach from the Bible. I don't care what it says. I love Jesus and I'm going to heaven. And meanwhile, they're living in filth. You know what I'm saying? And, and so that's the way our culture is. They're stubbornly unrepentant. They're stiff-necked. They're brazenly defiant of God and his people. How do people respond to you as a Christian? When you invite them to church nowadays, even up here in the gorgeous mountains in the country life of LJ, Georgia, I mean, this, the attitude of people is changing, right? And, and they're sort of brazenly defiant of God's people. What do, I want, what do I have to do with church? I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that and love God, right? 
I can, I can watch it on TV. So, so we have this, these attitudes that are alive and well in our culture and in our young people in our culture, and it's just like uh, Thyatira was. And what happened was, and we're going to have to be cautious of this as well, is that the church kind of became accepting of that. And before you know it, the spirit of Jezebel had invaded the church. And the next thing you know, there is a lady that comes along and says, hey, I'm more qualified than that uh, chauvinistic guy up there. I can teach you the Bible. After all, God is all love. And nobody knows love like women know love, right? Because you guys, you are just tough and hard and all that stuff. Anyway, so, so it had slipped into the church, and we have to guard against that as well. And they were being seduced by a false teacher who was leading them into open spiritual, let me mark that down, spiritual immorality. Now, I do think they were also involved in some pagan practices in the name of religion in the church uh, that God was not happy with, that the Lord Jesus kind of points out here. He got them to eat things so, uh, sacrificed to idols, which makes us think they were involved in the church with some of the pagan practices. Now, I know you all think I'm a dinosaur, but that's why I'm so adamant when it comes to the holidays. I don't want that to slip in. I don't want to do Halloween like the world around us. It's wicked. It shouldn't be a part of the church life. I don't want to do Satan Claus, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I don't want to do the Easter dummy, you know, and all that stuff. That's not what it's about. And we, we have just allowed it in the church, and they, you know, those that accept all that stuff see us as brute beasts, right? Just are uncaring and unkind. Not very loving. Certainly not nice. After all, we need nice, right? No, what we need today is wake up wake up you're on the road to destruction wake up and if the church isn't going to wake up i promise you our society will never wake up Amen. And that's why we need revival in the church so what is the message to the church out of thyatira the message is the same today as i think it was back then be pure in your devotion to god love jesus with all your heart Walk in the spirit, yield it, humble before God. Live holy in the physical aspect of your life. Don't sleep with people if you're not married. Don't get drunk and intoxicated. Don't do drugs and, and violate the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is your body. That's living holy unto God in a physical sense. We should walk sanctified in our thought process. I was talking to Trish earlier. She was, I think it was from somewhere um, she picked up that it was like 85% of men in our country regularly watch pornography on the internet because it's so readily available on their phones and their iPads and their computers. Can you imagine? That is not what God intends. That is not having a sanctified thought life as believers our thoughts are to be handed over to God. We're to take every thought captive unto obedience of Christ, says 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, right? And what about Philippians 8, 4, 8, where it says, Hey, whatsoever is ugly and nasty and slanderous, think on these things. It doesn't say that at all, does it? It says whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are kind, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are good, right? You speak on those things. That's whole sanctified thinking. We are to walk in that, Amen. live out holy in our physical life. By the way, the more sanctified your thinking life is, the more holy your physical life will be. Amen. The dirtier your thinking life is, the dirtier your physical life is going to be. I mean your mental life. The dirtier your physical life. And then the final thing, because we're a trying being, is what about our spirit? Our spirit is to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. So put those three together, right? We are to yield to the Holy Spirit's work in our inner man as he conforms us to the image of God's dear son, Jesus Christ. Then we're to allow him to sanctify our thought life so that we can live a physical life that is holy unto him and a testimony of the power of God at work in the life of a fallen being, right? Amen. So all of that needs to be taking place. Now that's all introduction, so now we get to start our text. Three things in your outline. By the way, I do have um, an outline somewhere over there, I think, that I filled in for you because sometimes I go all over the place. 
So let's talk about the Lord's perception, first of all, verse number 18 and 19. Then we're going to look at the church's heresy in verse 20 to 23. And this was Thyatira, but I think you'll see that obviously some of this stuff applies to this day. And then we see the sure promises of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I find those sure promises in verse 24 to 28 as encouragement in a day when it seems like the church has sort of given in to compromise. It's good to know that as God exercises judgment or discipline or chastisement in the life of unfaithful people, he also looks at the life of faithful people and he can differentiate between the two. We aren't automatically disciplined as a fellowship because every other fellowship is ungodly. You, you see what I'm saying? Or you're not necessarily disciplined because your neighbor is living ungodly. They can be chastened by God while God is blessing you at the same time. Make sense? So those sure promises kind of remind us of that. So let's read the text. Verse 18. And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith who? The Son of God. That's the divine title of Jesus Christ. His earthly title, he was called the Son of Man. That's his physical incarnation. But as the eternal God, he is the Son of God. Okay? Who hath his, who hath his eyes like unto the flame of fire. And you think about fire, you think about a gaze that's fiery. I mean, we're talking about the all-seeing God who has, you know, in his eyes the passion for holiness. And when he doesn't see it, then the wrath and the judgment follows afterwards. So he's the eyes of the flame of fire. And his feet are like fine brass. He says, I know your works, or thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and that the last to be more than the first. That is, their works are tremendous. I mean, the last part's even more than the first part. He says, notwithstanding, even though you're loving, even though you are um, working hard, even though you're in ministry, which is the word service, even though you are people of faith, even though you're very patient, there's something wrong. And here's what's wrong. He says, I have a few things against thee. Now watch this. I have this underlined in my Bible. I think it's very important. Because thou. He's speaking to the church. The faithful church. He's saying you are responsible for the condition of the church. You are accountable. You have allowed this to take place. In your, on your watch. Let's say it that way. And so as we read on, he says, Because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which what? Which what? Call it herself. God didn't call her a prophetess. She called herself one. I'm anointed. She's defiant of all that is orthodox, all that is right, and all that is biblical. I don't care what it says. I feel like God has called me to this. No, no, that's not biblical. It's not true. No matter how much you feel it. So it says she calleth herself a prophetess, and what is she doing? She's teaching, and she's seducing my servants. So the Lord's saying, even though I can see Jezebel front and center, clear as day, I recognize that my saints are there as well. But I'm telling you, I see her for who she is. She is a Jezebel, and I'm going to deal with it. He goes on, she is teaching them to commit fornication, that's immorality, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, he doesn't get specific about this, but he just kind of generally says fornication. And I'm telling you, anything that you do as a believer that is contrary to the will of God in the word of God, that is spiritual adultery. Every time you get into the world or get into bed with the world, that is spiritual adultery against Christ. You, you got me? I don't know how I can say it any clearer, but I don't guess I have to. And to eat being sacrificed to, to idols, which I think were some of the practices inside the church. They were bringing pagan stuff in the fellowship, hanging cupids on the wall and putting pagan sticks in the sanctuary and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so it goes on. He says, I gave her space to repent. So we see Jesus' patience, right? 
Even though she's teaching people wrong, even though she's leading them astray, he said, I gave her a chance to repent. Isn't that good? Isn't that good to know? We have a chance to repent of her fornication. And he goes on to say, and she what? Yeah. She was defiant. Now, I don't have to repent. I'm not doing anything wrong. I can just... I can just hear it now. It's you archaic old men. You're the problem, not us, not us new age feminized people. We we got we understand. We need to evolve to that place and be kinder, general, more gentle society. Uh-uh. That's not the deal. Notice what he says. Uh, behold, I will, and that always shakes me up when Jesus says, I'm going to do something, because if he says it, he means it, right? He says, I will. Will now I know I'm sorry out there in La La Land, but it's rather harsh language. He says, I will cast her into a bed, and then that committed adultery with her, and what is the bed? The great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So now he's moved from her repenting to all of those that she's led astray. So he's broadening out the perspective. He's not just going to judge the Jezebel. He's going to fall. He's going to judge all of those who are following her leadership. You got it? Um, so we want to be very careful about that. And he says, I will kill her children with death. That's shocking language isn't it, in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus said, the Savior of the world the one who was humble beyond measure, meek in his approach to life, gentle in how he dealt with people in the flesh, says, I will kill her children with death. What in the world is he saying? He's talking about the spiritual offspring of wickedness. All of the spiritual children, all of the ones that Jezebel manages to seduce, and they begin to follow that way. They are the offspring. Much like when people get born again, we call them the offspring of the Spirit. You know, offspring of God, offspring of the church, offspring of your ministry as you evangelize. He's saying, look, the Jezebel spirit has offspring too. I'm going to deal with her, and I'm going to kill her children. I'm going to wipe them out. And you say, well, that's awful harsh. Until... You recognize the Bible says that it's appointed unto death, and after this, what? The judgment. And then we find out in Romans it says the wages of sin is death, death right? So it, they're only getting what they're working for, what they're earning, and they're earning death. And so he says, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with them, and all the churches shall know. So here's why I'm doing this. I want the rest of the body of Christ to become awake and understand what's going on shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give every one of you according to your works. So he says, all of you that are faithful in your ministry and service of me, I'll give you what you deserve. All of you who are unfaithful in your service of me, I'm going to give you what you deserve. So he gets both groups in one, and I think that's encouraging to the saints, but also ought to be alarming to those who have gone astray. But again, I have little highlights, parentheses in my Bible, I will. And then I go down into verse number 23. He says, I will. Verse number 23 towards the end, I will. So he's, he's man, three times, I am going to deal with this in my church. I am not going to allow my church to forever be unfaithful to me. I will deal with those who are leading her astray. And then it says in verse 24, but unto you, I say, and unto the rest in thine time, as many as what? Have not this doctrine or the teachings of the Jezebel, and which have not known the depths of Satan. In other words, you haven't gone astray into pagan practices and and worship of the world and things of this world and sinful behavior like that. As they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So he's basically saying, I'm going to get you. But you guys are all right. That's what he's saying. I'm going to get you. But I'm all right with you guys. And it's kind of encouraging. Then he says, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. So, you know, an overcomer, there it is again. Just hang on to Jesus. I mean, you know 
that you're to live by faith in God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, you just stay faithful. That's what he's telling them. Hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and, he, and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. I think he's referring to the millennial kingdom. And guess what? When, remember he just said, hold fast till I come. And guess what? When he shows up on the scene, who's coming with him? We are. And guess what? During the millennial kingdom, we're going to reign with Christ on the earth. Amen. That's one of the promises. He says, you be faithful. You hang on to me. And when the day's right, their time's up, and you guys are going to be in charge. Amen. It's kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, we're not just talking about eternity. We're talking about the thousand-year millennial reign where we get to have power over the nations. And it's, it's kind of cool thought. And he shall, referring to Jesus, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. All the rebellious nations that forget God. I'm not mad at that, of course, it's not here. Even as I received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. That is, those who are overcomers will receive the morning star. Not referring to Lucifer. Some people say, oh, well, who's it that? The day star. It says the morning star. And the idea is it's the first star that pops up on the horizon when the new day is dawn. And so it's sort of giving us the idea of eternity and the new opportunity we're all going to have in the kingdom of God. And, and I'll talk about that when we get there. I'm not getting very far today, I can see. And then he says, um, verse number 29, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now my heart's prayer is that as we study this passage of Scripture, that and as I seek God uh, to teach me this passage and then to teach you that you are indeed hearing from the Spirit and not Brother Rick. And so I hope that you'll have ears to hear and that having those ears, you will hear. Because that's kind of what I say. He says, he that hath ears, that is those of you who have the ability, hear. You have the ability, so hear, do it. All right, so listen to what I'm saying. So we're looking at the Lord's perception is where we're at. Verse number 18, verse number 19. I'm just going to cover verse number 18, um, just sort of introductory, because I want to show you something real quick. We're looking at the Lord's perception. A in the outline is a revealing introduction. The description of Jesus here manifests that he has the sovereign right, he has his sovereign authority, and the ability and the willingness to measure out and to exact judgment on people. You say, no, no, not Jesus. Listen, when he came the first time, he came to die in our place. He came, so to speak, to be judged for us. He bore our sin to the cross of Calvary so that you and I might enjoy the righteousness of God imputed to us, right? He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's why he came the first time. But when he comes again, man, he's coming as a judge. You say, really? Yes, really. Yeah. Let me show you. Listen to this. It says, right, first of all, he is the Son of God. That's the divine title I told you about earlier. But I want you to turn in your Bible to John chapter 5, and I promise we'll go through this verse and we'll be done, okay, for today. We'll come back Wednesday, of course. For today, I want you to catch something that maybe you haven't caught in the past about Jesus. And for all those who flippantly sort of view Jesus is some manby pamby soft savior who couldn't even save himself from, uh, you know, the wrath of man. Well, listen, Jesus could have. He just chose not to. He said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I have the power to take it up again. Amen. A grave ain't no problem for me. I'm the all-powerful God, right? That's our Jesus. But notice what he says in John chapter 5. Listen to this, verse 22. I think we've forgotten this, or we have chosen to ignore this because we want to live our own way and just forget that one day there's an accounting. Listen to this. For the Father, refers to God the Father, right? Watch this. The Father, what? Judges. 
judges no man. What? I thought God judged everybody. The Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto who? Unto the Son. Now, why did the Father do that? Verse 23. Why? That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. So for the people out there in different faiths, different religions that say, well, we believe there's a God and there's only one God and we worship him, but we don't believe Jesus. We don't believe in Jesus. Then you've missed the message. God says, I want you to honor me by honoring my Son. It's one and the same. So he says, so that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, I don't care what you say about your religion, if you don't honor Jesus as Savior of the world, coming judge, you do not honor the Father. You do not really honor God. And whatever your religion is, it's a false religion. Whatever God you claim, it is not the true biblical God because the Father has given it to His Son and He wants us to worship the Son. And as we worship the Son, we are worshiping Him. Amen. We're saying, God, we believe what you said so much that we're willing to entrust ourselves to this Amen. and to yourself. It goes on. He says in verse 24, Verily, verily, truth upon truth, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, this is Jesus, he that heareth my word and believeth not on him that sent me. So they're supposed to work together. Jesus says, you believe on me, uh, you believe my word, and therefore you believe on him that sent me. So it's all intertwined is the idea there. And if you do, you believe on him that sent me, you have eternal life. And you shall not come into condemnation. But if you are passed, I'm putting you, but it is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, watch this, the hour is coming, now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. I think that's already at work. That's how you and I were saved. We heard the voice of God in the person of Jesus Christ in the, in the proclamation of Jesus through the gospel. And the voice of God said, Lazarus, come forth, right? Yeah. And we heard the voice, and we shall live, and we live in Christ Jesus. Now watch this, verse 26. For as the Father hath given life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Now watch. And hath given him to Jesus. Not only did he give him the ability to give life to us, but he says he's given him authority to what? Execute. Execute judgment also. Why? Because he was God incarnate. He was the Son, capital S, of man. He was, the, he was God incarnate. He has the right, he has the authority in order to ex, uh, exercise and execute judgment on the wicked. So yes, Jesus is the Savior of the world. And you need to embrace him as that because if you do not, he will be the judge of the world. Amen. All sinners will come under his judgment. And man, if you are found undone without Christ in the end, you're going to experience that judgment not only in death that is physical, but in death the Bible calls eternal or the second death, which is the lake of fire. The book of Revelation. Powerful stuff, huh? Amen. We're just getting started, so uh, can't go much further than that. We're out of time, uh, so we'll have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll, we'll close out our service. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you.